Greetings all, this is Rick Levine with your May 2022 forecast, and this is going to be a bit of a kick-ass month, I think. Um, uh, there's a lot going on, we'll get to all of that in just a minute. I need to take just a couple of minute detour to remind you that I'm going to be teaching a four-week course on um, horoscope interpretation, but focusing on timing, on, on transits, secondary progressions, solar arc directions. Um, it's going to be a four-week class. It'll run every Thursday afternoon through the month of May at 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. That's Pacific time, so you need to adjust your time zone accordingly. Um, and each week, I'm going to give two live uh, chart readings of people that are in the class. And when you register for the uh, course, you can submit your data and possibly get chosen to be one of the eight charts that I will use over the course. And I will focus on the techniques that I normally use, how to um, distinguish uh, what's important from what's not, because often there's so many pieces of information coming at us, we don't know really where to go. Um, you can then apply the techniques that I'll be using and teaching uh, for your own chart, for your friends, family, for your clients. But basically, we're going to be focusing on how a chart unfolds itself through time. And not only will you get um, over eight hours of classroom teaching done in Zoom, uh, but on top of that, oh, and by the way, if you can't make one or any of the classes, they will all be recorded. There will be transcripts of each of the classes, um, so you'll be able to go over them at your, at your leisure. Also included in the course is a one-hour uh, teaching that will be pre-recorded by me, an overview of timing techniques. Um, you can watch that prior to the first class if you have time. You'll get that when you register. And, um, and that's not only a one-hour teaching on, tran on transits, uh, um, progressions, and directions, and a few other things, um, but you'll also get a handout that has the summary of the various tools and techniques that we'll be using. Um, on top of that, there are a few other things that you get included in the package. And um, this whole deal is for $97. It's through the Astrology Hub. If you are an Inner Circle member at the Astrology Hub, or if you are one of my Patreon subscribers at any level, you get a 20% discount, which will bring that $97 price down to $77. Um, you can uh, register or find out more information with a complete uh, course curriculum at um, www.astrologyhub.com slash Rick Timing. And I look forward to seeing you there. It's going to be fun. You know, we've done these chart extravaganzas before. This is going to be a chart extravaganza part two. And they have been a lot of fun and a lot of learning also. The information will come hard and fast. And, um, and there are... Um, other courses that I've given through Astrology Hub, if you've taken any of them, that will help, but there are no prerequisites. As long as you know the rough meanings of the planet signs, houses, and aspects, you'll be covered, you'll be okay, um, but of course you can always go back and take those earlier courses should you choose. That's it. Um, I hope to see you during class. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a lot of fun focusing on timing because timing is where the action is. I mean, timing is really what people want to know. It's we want to understand what's going to happen when and how it's going to unfold and what opportunities are going to present and so on. So this is exciting work for me. I'll see you in class. All right. Now, Back to the future or back to the present? I guess it's back to the future because um, because we're looking at the month ahead. And the fact is that I am recording this a few days early. I'll put it up at the regular time at the beginning of the month, maybe a day early. 
But I'm heading down to Tucson, Arizona for an OPA, that's the Organization for Professional Astrology uh, conference that'll be down in Tucson, Arizona. I'm recording this on the evening of April 25th, and uh, we haven't even um, got to the new moon solar eclipse that'll be on April 30th, but we're going to pick it up on May 1st, and we'll be going right through the full moon eclipse, the lunar eclipse, that will be um, the middle of the month on May 15th, and um, and then we'll have another new moon before the month ends. So um, it's going to be a really, really busy month. Um, one of the things that makes this month so busy is we have a lot of sign changes. We have the second of two eclipses, um, which will be basically the end of eclipse season. Uh, we also have Mercury turning retrograde. We'll talk about that in a little bit, um, that Mercury turns retrograde on May 10th. But that means that by the first of the month, Mercury will already be in its shadow. We'll talk about what that means. The other thing that we have going on is we have some we have, we have a lot of planet uh, sign changes more more than usual and that's partly because Jupiter which just has whizzed through Pisces on its second time in Pisces because it was in Pisces earlier moved back into Aquarius now moved through Pisces in just a few months and on May 10th um, which is the day that Mercury turns um, retrograde, Jupiter uh, enters Aries. So May 10th is going to be a key day. Jupiter enters Aries on May 10th, but Mars enters Aries on May 24th. This is Mars coming back to its home sign. Um, and in this now, because Mercury is turning retrograde, which means it slows down and then backs up, the fastest moving planet this month is Venus. And Venus is just whizzing along right now. Um, Venus actually enters Aries on May 2nd. We begin the month with um, Venus uh, at the end of Pisces. In fact, the Taurus new moon uh, solar eclipse um, uh, on April 30th um, there is a Venus-Jupiter conjunction, and that Venus-Jupiter conjunction occurs at 27 degrees of Pisces. So Venus moves from Pisces into Aries <clears throat> just a couple days later on May 2nd, and then Jupiter follows and it moves into um, Aries on, on May 10th. What's interesting is that at the end of April, in, in the middle of April, we had the Jupiter-Neptune conjunction, which many of you have probably heard that I dubbed not just the elephant in the room, but the psychedelephant in the room, or the psychedelic elephant in the room, because Neptune um, is the sign of mind expansion and dreams and, and, and pushing reality out into the realms of imagination. The word psychedelic actually, you know, means in, in effect expanded mind. Um, and so the Jupiter-Neptune conjunction um, was the psychedelic elephant in the room that people were talking about but were so hypnotized by its sense of beauty and, and hope and all these wonderful things, which are all present. But somehow the, the elephant in the room that people didn't want to talk about or just didn't talk about is the fact that there's a dark side to everything. And the shadow side to the Jupiter-Neptune conjunction, and you'll understand why I'm talking about this, even though that was technically on April 12th. By the end of April, Venus lined up with Neptune and then Jupiter, kind of keeping that energy alive. And then in May... When, um, when Jupiter moves into Aries, Mars comes into Aries, and it will line up first with Neptune back in Pisces still, and then with Jupiter in Aries. And this is going to be the grand finale of this whole energy of these dreams and hopes and illusions that can be very, very intensely fulfilling because, remember, dreams create reality. And so there is this upside of it. But the downside is that we can get caught so we can we can get 
We can so get caught up. That's still not right. We can get ah, we can get so caught up in the upside of this, in the beauty that we end up being blindly optimistic. We look at things that are not okay and we project on them what could be. And 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 so we tend we tend to possibly miss some of the things that are going on, um, almost as if we're distracted by this psychedelic elephant, then we don't see the darker side or the shadow. But I think that by the time that Mars comes whizzing through um, and kind of creates a bit of finality on this, that we will see some of this stuff surface. So that's the lay of the land as we move into the month of May. And I'm going to bring up the chart now for, um, for May 1st and... Um, and on May 1st, we can see that we're still uh, experiencing this, this psychedelic traffic jam, this, this Piscean, dreamy, compassionate, um, can be delusional because it's Neptune in the midst of this whole pileup or, or stellium of Mars and Neptune and Jupiter and Venus. And as we move into the beginning of May, we see that that um, the Venus-Jupiter conjunction, although it's separating, Venus is already ahead of Jupiter, we're still getting the feel-goods from this. We're still getting the indulgence or maybe even over-indulgence. We need to be careful when the planets look too good because, because sometimes there is as the uh, Japanese say, that there can be a bee in the bouquet of flowers. And so we need to not be totally distracted by the beauty of the flowers and also be aware um, that there can be some downside to overindulging or making things look or sound or feel better than they really are. So let's just kind of take a run through the month um, and uh, see what we got. Um, but like I said before, it's a really interesting month. There's a lot going on. And I think, uh, you know, for a long time, um, the month of March of 2020, it seemed to last a year and a half. That's now in the past. I mean, um, I don't have a good, clear sense of what may or may not happen with any reoccurrence, uh, you know, of, um, of of the COVID or whatever the the, the, the pandemic issues are or will um, be that, that are still lingering in many ways. But regardless, it's almost like we've turned the corner um, away from whatever it was that happened in 2020. And it's important, though, that we don't lose the lessons. Remember, 2020, um, the year of uh, Breonna Taylor, George, George Floyd, there was a whole lot of effort and energy uh, put into the you know, Black Lives Matter. Um, and it seems like it's easy to... Um, to try to put things into the past when they're not right on top of us. And all I got to say is that these issues are still right on top of us. We just might be more and more distracted by how fast the future is coming. Um, I'm reminded of the William Gibson line, William Gibson, author of some brilliant science fiction. Um, William Gibson said, the future is here already. It's just unevenly distributed. So we are looking at May as kind of a fast track now into the future. And on May 1st, the aspect that's exact is Venus um, is um, actually... Uh, forming a sextile with Pluto. Um, Jupiter is also, but Jupiter, it's it's still coming into it, um, that Jupiter doesn't hit the exact sextile to Pluto until May 3rd, but it's already within a degree. And so we're getting this deepening, this intensity, this... <clears throat> and remember, Pluto just turned retrograde. It's almost like Pluto is the last holdout of all the planets in Capricorn. And and it doesn't want to let go. Pluto isn't going to let go of Capricorn. It'll move tentatively into Aquarius um, in 2023, then back into Capricorn, and then on into Aquarius for real um, in 2024. But until then, Pluto is still finishing up 
its job of deconstructing uh, the social structures, uh, economics, banking, roads, government, all of those things that seem to have been falling apart over the last years. Pluto is not quite done with its work, and yet as Venus uh, sextiles uh, Pluto, and then Jupiter comes in. Remember, it was Jupiter's conjunction with Pluto three times in 2020 that matched the peaks of the first three waves of the reporting of uh, COVID. So I'm not sure if this has any um, um, COVID-related stuff that will happen, but things bubble up. Um, Jupiter, things bubble up to the surface and into awareness, and they're coming from Pluto, from deep and hidden places. But this time around, Venus is there also. So maybe, maybe, just maybe it will be a, a little bit sweeter. That's May 1st. On May 2nd, we actually have Venus moving into Aries, and um, I am the proud owner of a Venus in Aries, but the textbooks tell us that Venus doesn't particularly like being in Aries because Venus is at home in Taurus and Libra, and Aries is opposite one of Venus's home signs or domiciles, which means that Venus in um, in Aries is actually exiled. It's in her detriment. It's far away from where she would, you know, from where she calls home. And and yet Venus in Aries is very much an immediate sense of, I like this right now. There's that sense of the presence. I have a friend who used to say that when Venus was moving through uh, Pisces, she was dressing in 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 angora and soft um soft um uh furry things if you will and I don't necessarily mean having been alive, just so that we're clear about that. But there's a softness of Venus in, in Pisces where she is exalted. She moves into Aries, and it's not that she's not hot, but she turns in all of those gentle, soft um, uh, clothing for like red that would be Mars, Aries, for like red leather. There's something about Venus and Aries that's right up front and and is very engaged, but it's only engaged while you have its attention. Um, Venus in Aries is very much a, um, you know, here today, gone tomorrow, um, unless the energy is held, unless that spontaneity is, is kept alive. But Venus moves into Aries on May 2nd, And also, Mars actually makes a half square to Pluto on May 2nd. Remember, on the 1st, we had Venus making a sextile, making that deepening energy really sweet. Really, um, there's a sense of vulnerability and intimacy as that Venus creates the sextile with Pluto, and Jupiter is still coming toward it. But right now, in the middle of it, on the second, Mars makes that half square to to Pluto, and this is disruptive. This is assertion, aggression. This is not nice, necessarily, uh, but energy does come to the surface. Then on May 3rd, as we mentioned, the Jupiter sextile to, um, uh, to Pluto is exact. And here's a day when we can encourage things from, from the underworld, from the darkness, uh, to come up into the light, because in the light we can deal with it. It's, it's making that which we are unaware of. It's like making that something that we're aware of so we can process it, so we can work with it. Things are much scarier and have much more power over us when we don't know what they are, which is why Jupiter sextile to Pluto is an opportunity to shine the light into, into, into the darkness. On May 5th, we have... Um, well, well let, let's back up first. Um, on May 4th, we have Mars making a sextile with Uranus, and this can be quite exciting. It can also be a bit disruptive. There's a little bit of disruption of energy coming through this with the Mars first making the half square to Pluto, and then Mars um, just turning around a day later and making a sextile to Uranus. And in fact, the sun is right there also lining up with Uranus 
That's not exact until the 5th, but once a year, the sun lines up with all of the slower-moving planets. Um, And so the sun's annual conjunction with Uranus is on the 5th, but on the 4th, as the Mars makes that sextile um, to Uranus and then the sun comes moving through it, um, again, this is a release of energy. This is stuff that's been blocked. This is the dam that's been built, so all of a sudden gives way. There's There's a flood. Not necessarily a water, you know, a a, a real climatological flood, but a flood of energy, a flood of information, uh, a flood of emotion. This is Mars in Pisces. Um, And yet these are things that we thought were said and done. We thought that because the sun and Uranus are in Taurus, and Taurus is holding its position in an earth sign. It's practical. This can also be money-related. We might see some, some something crazy or something give way um, in relationship to banking, economics, the stock market, um, etc. And so that conjunction is exact. The sun um, conjunct Uranus is exact on the, the 5th. And incidentally, we can expect communication around this, because on the 5th, we also have Mercury forming a sextile with Venus. And so there's this sense of it's easy to, to, to say nice things. It, it's easy to, to, to speak in a way that even if, if it's Mercury, it's clever. We're actually, it's almost flirtatious that, that um, Mercury um, <clears throat> sextile to Venus. Remember, Mercury um, at the end of April moved into um, in, into uh, Gemini. And so that Mercury, in fact, um, being in Gemini, um, it's at home. Um, and of course, it will. it's slowing down. When a planet slows down, it gains power. Mercury normally can move up to nearly two degrees a day. That's twice as fast uh, as the apparent motion of the sun. And yet now, as we move ahead, Mercury is moving moving um, more like a, a quarter of a degree a day. It's moving very slowly because as a planet turns retrograde, it's like a pendulum that goes back and forth. In order for it to change directions, it has to slow and then stop before it begins moving forward and gain speed again. So we have this Mercury at home in Gemini making the sextile with Venus in Aries. I mean, this is hot. This is flashy. This is in the moment. Um, but this energy definitely is energy that comes and, and goes. Uh, remember, though, that Mercury is slowing down. Um, on the 7th, the Sun makes a sextile with Mars, and this is an easy flow of energy. This is an energy that actually moves. Again, maybe that which was released when, the, um, when, when Mars was sextile to, um, to Uranus a couple days ago, now the energy is flowing a little bit smoother um, as the Sun makes that sextile to Mars, and we're actually able to get make progress We're getting somewhere. We're actually doing something. Um, This is um, exact on the 7th. um, And then by the 10th, look how slow Mercury is moving because on the the 7th, Mercury is at four and a half degrees of Gemini. On the 8th, it's still at four and three quarters of degrees. Um, on the ninth, it's um, still not at five degrees. It's at it's only moved a few minutes over the past 24 hours. It's at four degrees 50 minutes. These are all noon Pacific time. Um, and by the tenth, when it actually turns retrograde, it moves less than one minute of arc. That's one sixtieth of a degree in 24 hours. For all practical purposes, Mercury isn't moving at all, which means that Mercury has a tremendous amount of power while it's not moving. It's almost like it's holding still and everything else is moving around Mercury. It's kind of uh, the opposite of the way that Mercury normally is. That's on the 10th. But the other thing that happens on the 10th is that Jupiter, you can see here at noon, Jupiter is at 29 degrees Pisces, 57 minutes. But later in the day, um, in in fact, just, um, oh, about 
nine o'clock this evening um, that Jupiter moves from Pisces um, into Aries. And this is huge because remember, Jupiter really um, changes signs once a year, even though because of its retrograde in this year, in this calendar year of 2022, uh, Jupiter will have been in Aquarius, Pisces, and Aries. That's very unusual. Um, but the fact is that Jupiter um, in Aries is very powerful. Um, this is a new beginning again. This is like this is like uh, getting a kickstart to something that you've already started. It's like a boost. It's like um, it's like having an energy drink, and and things open up, and and opportunity swoops in, and and things are really uh, moving faster once that Jupiter moves into Aries. Um, in Pisces, it, we were submerged. We were underwater. We were in our emotions. We were in our dreams, our imagination, in our illusions and our delusions. And of course, with that Jupiter so close to Neptune, that was like, you know, that was even even more so. Um, but even though Jupiter is, um, is, is in Aries, the psychedelic elephant hasn't quite left the room because it won't until Mars sweeps across first Neptune in Pisces, and then Jupiter in Aries, and then it's going to be like, ah, we're in new territory now. I mean, we're already in new territory by May 11th with Jupiter in Aries, but we're holding on to some of the stuff from, from the past, and it's going to take us a little bit longer to let go. The other thing is that on the 10th, um, we also have um, Venus forming a half square with Saturn. In, in fact, this is a bit of a rough period. It's almost like an adjustment to that Jupiter that's so new in the sign of new, Aries. And because we have Venus making a half square with Saturn, holding back that energy, Venus is, remember, Venus in Aries wants to let loose. It wants to be in the moment. And yet with that half square to Saturn, Saturn saying, whoa, 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 not so fast. Okay, take a deep breath, hold back. You'll get what you need to get, but you're not going to get it today. Even though Jupiter's there saying, wait, this is even bigger than we thought. It's kind of like we're getting things from two sides um, of the, both sides of the equation at the same time. But then in, in addition to that, Jupiter, which has just moved into Aries, Jupiter forms a half square with Uranus. Now, this is electric. This is, again, half squares are like squares. They're conflictive. They're, they, they're, 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 they're anxious um, because they're like two different things. They're not getting along, but, but we can work to creatively resolve that tension, um, that stress, and that Jupiter to Uranus can be incredibly exciting. This is something totally new. Unfortunately, it can be too much. And I think that we need to look at this period of time of May 10th, really on through the 15th or so, but May 10th, when so much is going on, Mercury turns retrograde, Jupiter moves into, um, into Aries, Venus forms that half square with Saturn, Jupiter forms a half square with Uranus. We're pushing forward. We're holding back. We don't know what we're doing. Things are like really kind of like, it's almost like playing pinball and the, and, and the machine's just gone tilt. And now we have to reset somehow. Um, May 10th, 11th, I think is going to be an interesting period of time. But on the 15th, we have Venus in Aries catching up to Chiron. So we have a Venus-Chiron conjunction. And, you know, this is something that can be very meaningful. We can learn a lot, but it might not be an easy thing to face because often Chiron has to do with lessons that are attached to old hurts, old wounds, old vulnerabilities. And Venus here can sweeten that but but it's it's like Chiron is also the mentor. It's also the maverick. So in a way, this Venus lining up with Chiron can be indicative of stepping out 
side of a of of the box too far of 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 taking that again venus which is in the moment somehow too too much too fast maybe needing to pull back um a bit um or learning uh, the hard way something that was an old wound that's now back in our um in, in our experience or something happens in the present moment that reminds us of this thing in the past and we need, need to deal with it um, it's not necessarily bad but it it can be um it, it can be painful or can be um some pain in in involved the other thing that happens on the um on the 15th is that the sun um, moving toward the latter degrees of Taurus now. And remember, we've been in Taurus season where we just want simplicity, we want stability, we, we want things to be nice. And yet the sun on May 15th forms an exact square from 24 degrees of Taurus um, to 24 degrees of Aquarius. And this can be um, hitting a wall. I always think of Saturn as the authority. Saturn is the hammer comes down and says, "Whoop! you know, you can't do this. You have to do this first. Saturn is hitting a speed bump. But Saturn, if we negotiate it well, is also... Um, it's also maximum control. Um, you know, I think of Saturn sometimes as we're going around a curve, and if we're going too fast, we can go off the road. But there's that magic spot where we're actually really moving. We're going fast, but we're gripping the road and we're doing it with such precision that Saturn actually works in our favor. However, more often than not, with the sun square Saturn, we give ourselves a hard time. We go through a period of self-doubt. We question whether or not we're doing the right thing. And often we pull back a little bit. We get serious. We go internal. We do more work to make, to make what we're doing better, um, which ultimately can be very positive, but it can be a little bit tricky as, as, as we go through it. Um, this is all on the... Um, on the 15th, but notice also on the 15th at noon that the moon at 19 degrees of Scorpio is heading toward an opposition to the sun at 24, almost 25 degrees of, of Taurus. And we actually have the second eclipse of this season. The first was the Taurus new moon back at the end of April, <clears throat> which was conjoined or or coming into a conjunction with Uranus. Now we have the full moon eclipse, which is at 9.14 p.m. Pacific time. And this full moon eclipse um, is not, it, it, it's, it's well, well, I shouldn't say well out of range, but it's out of range of Uranus. I mean, we're looking at nine degrees um, of orb away from, from Uranus. Um, but this um, this eclipse is trying to Mars and Neptune, and look how close Mars and Neptune are. Remember I said earlier uh, we were going to be coming into Mars, first joining with Neptune and then joining with Jupiter later in the month. Uh, <clears throat> well, well, here, here we are, um, and the um, Mars-Neptune conjunction is, is, is about 23, it's almost two degrees um, a, a, apart, um, but it's coming in pretty close. And so we have this full moon in Scorpio, this intense, extreme emotional um, reactivity um, in a trine with Mars and with Neptune. And Mars and Neptune together are sometimes rather complicated. Um, Mars and Neptune are what Grant Louis calls in the natal chart, the shapeshifter. It's the person whose emotions actually affect how they appear to be physically. You know, someone can seem to be 10 feet tall when they're feeling like they're on top of the world. And that same person, once they get caught embezzling funds or or doing something or whatever and all of a sudden that person which looked like he or she or they were amazing all of a sudden they're very very small now not everybody's physicality um, matches their changes of emotions as extremely as a mars neptune but the deal with that mars neptune um, is which is exact on the 17th 
Um, but here on the 15th, on the day of the eclipse, they're close enough. And, and, and the deal with Mars and Neptune together is that they can be misleading. They can be purposefully misleading, or they can be accidentally misleading. We can be misinterpreted, we can be misread, we can misunderstand what someone says, or we can very, very deliberately conjure up a false message and deliver it with great clarity um, because um, it's almost like advertising stuff is Mars, Neptune. It, it, it basically appeals to our sense of imagination and desire. Um, uh, it, it's been said that, that playing chess is the greatest waste of human intelligence in the world outside of an advertising agency. <laughs> you know, advertising agencies try to convince us to buy something or to do something or to not do something or to vote for someone or to change our mind somehow. And normally when they do that, they're not just doing it by delivering a neutral message. They're delivering a message that is emotionally charged and packed. And here we have that Mars and Neptune doing that. And yet it's the Mars and Neptune that are taking the pressure off of this full moon eclipse. Now remember, lunar eclipses often have to do with letting go of something in the past. So what is it that we need to walk away from? What is it that we need to let go and be in the past rather than continue carrying it into the present moment so that it feels like it won't go away? Um, this can be something personally, it can be in a relationship, it could be at a job, it could be at, um, in your community, in your family, it can be politically, um, it can be on any and many different levels. But I think that this eclipse is going to be very interesting, particularly because of this Mars-Neptune conjunction, which, as I said earlier, becomes exact by May 17th. Let's move this ahead to the 17th. You can see that the moon is now off into Sagittarius, and Mars and Neptune are at the same degree, um, and a little later in the day past noon, um, Mars will be at the same degree and minute as Neptune. Um, this is... Um, uh, this is important because we're still, even though the eclipse is over, even though the intensity of the full moon is gone, we're still, we're still under the influence. And again, I'm going to conjure up that psychedelic elephant, that elephant that, that may look like it's in a state of samadhi or enlightenment or perfection, and yet we may be misled on purpose. This is a good period of time to bring ourselves back down uh, to reality, to find a center of gravity so that we don't just float off on someone else's truth that may or may not be our truth at all. By the 19th, we have the sun moving toward the very last degrees of, um, of Taurus, and the sun makes a trine with Pluto, incidentally, right around the same time that the moon in Capricorn, like Pluto in Capricorn, that the moon will be lining up with Pluto. Um, here on the 19th, I think we have another intense day. We're doing another round of deep diving, but I don't think that this is as difficult um, as some of the other Pluto dives, because we have the trine to the sun and Taurus, we want to do something with what, what's been hidden. The energy is now out in the open. What can we do with it? How can we make it um, useful and work for us rather than just burying it again? And the reason why we want to do something positive with it is that on the 19th, we also have Mercury, Mercury retrograde. Back at one degree of, um, of Gemini, it will retrograde back into Taurus on the 22nd. But right now, that Mercury at one degree of Gemini is, um, is sextile Jupiter. Uplifting, big ideas, thoughts are based upon some higher idealism. Uh, um, our, our spirits are, are inspired or inspiring. And so in some way, this combines with the depth of that sunshine Pluto, I think, in a uh, very positive manner. So we'll see how that plays out. But I think that the 19th actually does offer some 
um, some potential uh, for healing and or for moving things into a, into a new place. On the 20th, we have um, the sun moving from Taurus into Gemini. Um, here at noon, you can see the sun is at 29 degrees Taurus and three quarters, 29 and three quarters. So, um, so by, um, later this evening, about 6.30, I think it's, uh, 6.22 exactly PM Pacific time, that sun will move into Gemini. And interestingly enough, we have, um, Mercury at home in Gemini, backing into the sun because that Mercury is retrograde. And remember that Mercury retrograde period, we're going to swing back and talk about that as a whole cycle in, in, in a few minutes. But remember, Mercury retrograde is, is, is going back into the past. It's looking backward. It's, it's seeing where it's been. And yet on the 21st, the sun lines up with Mercury. And this is Mercury coming between the sun and and Earth. This is an inferior conjunction because Mercury is inside the orbit um, of the Earth. Um, a superior conjunction is when Mercury is all the way out on the far side of the Sun. But remember, when a planet gets close to Earth, that's when it goes retrograde. So because this is retrograde, we know that this is an inferior conjunction, but it's still occurring um, in Gemini, matter of fact, it's occurring at zero degrees of Gemini. Um, you can move that ahead, and we can see that on May 21st, we have the sun lined up with, um, with Mercury at zero degrees of Gemini, and yet Mercury is at home in Gemini, and yet Mercury isn't staying there. Mercury's heading for safety. Mercury's heading for security. Mercury's heading back into the hills, getting out of the spotlight of the noise and, and moving back into Taurus, and it will do that tomorrow, meaning May 22nd. And we'll get there in just a moment. Um, but I think that this is a really interesting alignment because the sun is just ready to kind of buzz, make noise. It's moving into Gemini and it's excited about everything it knows and how it wants to share and connect the dots and be social. And, and Mercury retrograde saying, whoa, wait a minute, let's go inward. I don't think we can do this yet. And then Mercury backs into Taurus and says, I'm not as talkative as, as you are, meaning to the sun. Um, and we move this ahead from the 22nd um, to the 23rd. Oh, also on the 22nd, we have Mars making a sextile with Pluto. Again, this is the deeper energy coming up, um, and it's expressing, it's expressing easily. But you know, if someone else is expressing really powerful, tyrannic, deep energy easily, it may not be good for us. There's two sides to every planetary expression, but this does mean that that energy is coming up in, in a manner that is um, easier to bring up to the surface. Um, and yet this can also um, be two people working out a negotiation from a war or a conflict, Mars and Pluto, but it can also be someone turns the volume up on a war or conflict because that sextile says those energies are feeding each other. And remember, Mars is the god of war, assertion, and aggression, and Pluto is the lord of the underworld. So um, again, we'll have to see how it plays out, but I think that this 21st period of time into the 22nd when, when that's exact um, and when Mercury backs up into Taurus, this is all, I think, a lot of changing that is, um, is going on, almost like a changing of the guards. By the 23rd, the sun is now sextiling Jupiter. The sun, um, remember, Mercury did that before, but now with the sun sextiling Jupiter, again, we got opportunity. We have potential. We have, we, we have doors opening, but just because opportunity presents itself doesn't mean that it's going to end up as good as we think it is, but sometimes it's taking the opportunity um, and even overextending or overexpanding that teaches us the lesson and we get to do something that we didn't, that we wouldn't have done otherwise. Jupiter says, hey, this looks better than it normally does. Try it. And when you actually do it, you may turn something into a magnificent um, situation or that opportunity may just kind of remain out of reach. 
But I do think that the 23rd does show some um, some signs of opportunity. Mercury also forms a sextile with Mars. There's an easier expression here. We get to move. We get to behave in a way that is more consistent with what we believe and what we um, and what we think. But remember, we're believing and thinking a little bit slower now because we don't want to be fooled that Mercury having retrograded back into Taurus is not in a hurry to say anything or to jump to a conclusion um, as it was when it was in Gemini. It'll be back in Gemini, but not until next month. Um, as we get to the 24th, we get to Venus making a sextile um, with Saturn. And before we had that half square, which was not comfortable. The Venus sextiling Saturn says, you know what? I'm not going to get what I want today, but that's great because it means that I can work towards getting something better in the future. Venus um, is fulfillment of desire in Aries now. Saturn is like hard work and you need to have everything right to, to get through the gate so to speak. Saturn is authority. Saturn is the taskmaster. Saturn is the hard work. And when Venus sextile Saturn, Venus says, you know what? The hard work is worth it if I'm going to get what I want. So I'll basically set the shortcut idea aside and I will do what needs to be done so that I can get the rewards that I want to earn and I'd be much happier getting a reward that was sustained gratification even if I have to wait for it rather than immediate gratification that comes and goes. That's the um, Venus sextiling Saturn on the 24th. Um, on the 24th, we also have Mars moving into Aries. At noon, you can see it shows that Mars at 29 degrees Pisces, 52 minutes. Um, and just a, a little bit later, actually at about 417, at about, at 417 p.m. Pacific time. Look how close that is now to Jupiter. We talked about that earlier. We'll have more to say about that in a moment. But the real message here, as Mars moves into Aries, Mars goes, I'm home and I know what to do in Aries. Mars at in Aries basically is unrestrained Mars. This isn't always good because Mars can be um, a bit brash, pushy, uh, uncontained. Mars has this sense of this urgency and, and immediacy and that present moment push and Mars can be in your face. Um, and so as Mars moves into Aries, Mars is in its power. And not only is Mars in its power because it's at home, but it's also joining up with the magnifying lens of the cosmos, Jupiter. So Mars is even going to be bigger, better, stronger, more than it normally is, which just may be too much. We will see how this plays out, but that Mars um, uh, will... Um, will 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 be in um, in uh, Aries. Say yeah, Mars um, will be in Aries all the way through um, the first week of July, um, and so we have this period of time where Mars is back at home, and we can expect to really see some forward movement. Uh, again, on all fronts, uh, personal, um, governmental, political, um, social, um, uh, all fronts are, are affected. But remember that Mars, having moved into Aries um, on the 24th in the afternoon, um, is now also moving toward its conjunction with Jupiter. On the 25th, we have retrograde Mercury forming a trine with Pluto. Uh, Mercury formed a trine with Pluto last month as Mercury was moving direct before it went from Taurus into Gemini. And now we're getting a replay on that. We will get a third and final replay on that when Mercury turns direct um, and makes that trine to Pluto again as it moves um, into, um, into Gemini next month. 
That Mercury trine Pluto, though, again, is the ability to communicate with a real authenticity and power if we're speaking the truth. Pluto doesn't like it when we try to take its power and use it for personal gain. Pluto likes the the rule of the, you know, for the many, um, the good of the people, the, um, what was the Star Trek line, uh, Mr. Spock? The needs of the many outweigh those of the uh, outweigh the needs of the few. I think it was uh, something from his home planet Vulcan. Um, Mercury in um, um, Mercury in Taurus says what it knows. It, it it speaks simply, and yet its trying to Pluto gives it a power that allo- that enables it to actually create evolutionary transformation, which is a lot of what we can expect through um, this month as um, first the sun and now Mercury form those um, uh, smooth uh, evolutionary uh, trines with, with, with Pluto. On May 26th, we have Mars making a half square with Uranus. Again, disruptive, um, uh, anxious, um, not sure how this is going to work. Something comes out of the blue, the lightning strikes, and we didn't even know there was a storm. Something happens that that is that is um, uh, unexpected and and brilliant. And when I say brilliant, I don't necessarily mean good. I mean like when the lightning flashes, it's brilliant. It it lights things up. It gives us a sense of of awareness, whether it's something we would like to be aware of or not doesn't doesn't matter um on the 26th we have venus now squaring pluto so we've had this venus um uh i'm sorry we've had this pluto action um and um venus actually um squares pluto on the 28th uh, i'm sorry venus squares pluto on the 26th and then moves into Taurus on the 28th. Uh, because Pluto is at 28 and a half degrees of Capricorn, it's only a degree and a half away from the next sign. So first Venus will make that square to Pluto. This is a bit more disrupted. This is a bit more conflictive. This is not a trine. This is um, my feelings, my emotions are not necessarily in tune with the stuff that's coming up from the depths. It's a little bit harder. Um, and, um, and, and so this day we might actually have to work a little bit more on getting through the darkness or whatever it is that comes up. But Venus moves into Taurus um, on the 28th, and this is interesting because we now have Venus and Mars both in their home signs. And actually, once Mercury turns direct and moves back into Gemini, we'll have, um, Ge- we'll have Mercury in its home sign of Gemini, Venus in her home sign or its home sign of Taurus, and Mars in its own sign of Aries. An interesting scenario that gives those three innermost personal planets, Mercury, how I think, Venus, what I like, Mars, how I go and get what I want or get away from what I don't want. Um, And all of these three personal planets are in their domiciles, or they will be. Um, Right now, when I say right now, I mean um, on the 28th, um, we just have Venus and Mars both in their their home sign. Um, We also, though, have on the 28th pushing that Mars... Um, is pushing towards its conjunction with Jupiter, which is actually exact on the 29th. You can see that by noon, Mars is on the other side of, of Jupiter. Um, this is exact at about 3.30 a.m. Pacific time, but this is a slow enough moving transit that we'll be feeling it for a couple of days prior and probably a day after. Mars, Jupiter together can be wonderful. It can be great, um, but it also can be too much. You know, Mars, Jupiter is kind of like a physical sportiness. It's it's combat. Um, it could be like freestyle martial art combat because Mars is physical and Jupiter um, is takes it to the next level. And so that Mars, Jupiter together can be um, the mental framework that we have that makes us very the, the mental framework that we can change in order to uh, perform in a superior manner um, like um 
uh, kind of doing the the work on the inside so that the physical form follows. This is enthusiasm. Um, the word enthusiasm comes from Greek, I think, entheos. Theos, the same root of theology, meaning God, and theos, meaning with God. And so enthusiasm is like, It's like, if I'm really enthusiastic, my crap isn't in the way. I'm just channeling the divine. I mean, anyone who's enthusiastic. Enthusiasm is just being in that moment and letting it flow through you. Um, And so we have here at the close of the month, this Venus conjunct Jupiter, which I think is incredibly powerful. And as you can see, we're coming right into that new moon, which is early in the morning on the 30th. This is not an eclipse, um, but it is a new moon in Gemini. Um, it's at nine degrees of uh, of Gemini. Um, and this new moon, again, there's this lightness uh, uh, on our feet. There's this sense because we still have these the, the, this trine energy left over from Pluto. We have the deeper energy that's been cooking, but now it's almost like we're released. We can fly. Um, we can we we actually have movement here, and it'll be interesting to see what that movement brings and which way we go with it. But I think that this is a um, a, a perfect ending um, to a month because it's really more the beginning of the next month. Um, it, it, it's odd. We've had a few months where I've said that that the month didn't end until the first or second of the next month because of a, of a, of a uh, new moon. Um, this is just the opposite. This is almost like this new moon signifies a new beginning. Um, um, Mercury is still retrograde and it's retrograding back into um, a square with Saturn. It won't get there until June. Um, but we also now have Mars past that conjunction to Jupiter. What I really want to say is Mars passed its conjunction to the Jupiter-Neptune complex of energies. And as I said at the very beginning, when Mars conjoins first with Neptune, then with Jupiter, on the far side of that, we're finally free of that psychedelic elephant or the psychedelephant that was in the room. And it's almost like we're able to see things um, as, as they are. Um, we're moving into new territory now, and as we hit the beginning of June, I think that we um, are holding very little left over um, from from the past, even though there's always things from the past that come into the future. Um, I really think that May is about movement away from what was towards what will be, but it's not. it's no longer what was, and yet it's not yet what will be. And so there's this whole piece of May that is about dynamic change. And I don't think we get to see where that change is going yet. In fact, I don't think we're going to get to see where the change is really going until we get through this fall as the um, Saturn-Uranus square, which right now um, is about nine degrees of orb, um, Uranus at 16, Saturn at 25, um, Taurus and, and Aquarius. But as, um, um, as Saturn turns retrograde, um, that, that's going to get closer and closer and closer. Um, and it will come with back within uh, almost a half a degree of orb by September, October, and even up until election day. And so this the immediate picture is transition. The immediate picture is setting up what's next. The longer term picture is we're not going to know really what's next until we get through the November, December period of time. That's it for now. It's a lot. It's quite a month. It's it, it's an extraordinary month. There's so much change, so much dynamic energy. Um, for those of you who are on Patreon, um, that's the $3 a month level. Um, I will see you for the mid-month report. Um, remember, you can join Patreon at that level and pick up a 20% discount uh, on the um, May uh, ch- chart extravaganza timing uh, course Um, And uh, don't forget that is at um, astrologyhub.com slash ricktiming. 
Also, my appreciation, as always, to uh, my Patreon supporters, subscribers. Thank you, guys. You make all this possible. And don't forget, I have a daily column that I write on Instagram and Facebook. That's at Rick Levine Astrologer, Instagram.com slash Rick Levine Astrologer, and Facebook.com slash Rick Levine Astrologer. That's enough for now. We'll see you around. Think cosmically as always. Push that envelope of your mind out as far as you can, but then bring it back and act locally. I'm Rick Levine. That's it for now.